This week, former Charleston, South Carolina Mayor Joseph Riley and Professor Carrie Taylor co-teach a course at the Citadel Military College looking at why a new African-American history museum is being built in the city. They're joined by author and former state representative Bakari Sellers. My father stayed in prison for about a, a month while his bond was denied. He was housed on death row. They deemed him to be an outside agitator. Um, until he was granted a bond later in between the night of February 8th, 68, and the time of my father's trial. All the officers who fired shots into the group of students were tried, and they were all found not guilty. The former South Carolina state representative also discusses his political career. The mission of the museum, the International African American Museum, is as follows. To honor the untold stories of the African American journey at one of our country's most sacred sites. And these stories continue to unfold. Bakari Sellers is today's guest speaker. He is a talented storyteller. My vanishing country, and I hope you all can see this, uh, my vanishing country, which was published in 2020, uh, his memoir is a most inspiring book written by a most talented young South Carolinian. Bakar Sellers made history in 2006, when at just 22 years old, he defeated a 26-year-old incumbent state representative to become the youngest member of the South Carolina State Legislature and the youngest African-American elected official in our country. In 2014, he was a Democratic nominee for Lieutenant Governor in the state of South Carolina. Bakari is a talented political analyst and was recently named a, 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 a CNN political analyst. And I know many of y'all get to see him as do we. And he's recently been named to Times 40 under 40 list. He has followed the footsteps of his father, civil rights leader, and I'm proud to say my friend Cleveland Sellers, and his tireless commitment to service by promoting progressive policies to address issues ranging from education and poverty to preventing domestic violence and childhood obesity. Bakari is a practicing attorney in Columbia, South Carolina, and a very proud father of adorable twins. Please welcome Bakari Sellers. Thank you so much. Um... Mr. Mayor, I um, might need to apologize before we get started. I try to schedule things as close to the noon hour as possible so my twins are asleep. Uh, but if you hear any two-year-olds in the background, they're not uh, your students. Uh, they're not any cadets um, in the background. Those are, that, that is Sadie and Stokely um, running the house as they normally do. Um, I can also say that as an extrovert, um, it pains me not being able to be there with you. You know, most times I'm able to come down and grab some lunch in Charleston and come visit your class and spend some time. Uh, but hopefully, uh, uh, thanks to uh, Moderna and Pfizer, maybe we'll be able to get back together one day uh, very, very soon. Um, and for your leadership, Mr. Mayor, I, I just always thank you for that. Um, and your friendship to my family. Um, you know, you keep my dad straight, which is a hard, hard task. So I appreciate that. Uh, to all of all of the individuals who've taken time out of their schedule to join us today, um, thank you. Um, you know, I want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have a question, you know, throw your hand up and we'll get to it um, whenever. Um, or you can throw it in the, the comments. I, Especially to um, the cadets and young people as we um, talk today, I think we have to take stock as we get started on where we are. Um, I always think it's necessary to um, place both feet squarely on the ground and be in the moment. Um, you know, I look at this year and the last 18 months as one of Mayor Riley, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you've been around just a little bit longer than I, but this is one of the uh, weirdest convergences of historical events 
to ever happen. This is um, 1918, 1919, where you have a great pandemic meets 1928, 29, where you have economic volatility. Um, some people are like, what economic volatility are you talking about? I mean, we literally have people who are millionaires because they invested in GameStop, right? I mean, what are you going to invest in next blockbuster? I mean, like that, that doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, and then you have, um, you know, we just saw what happened 10 miles apart um, in I mean, Indianapolis. I mean, America today, I think that I think yesterday would probably stand out as one of the harshest indictments of how far we have to go as a country. Uh, you have a trial for a um, white officer shooting a, on a, or, or with his knee on the back of a neck of an unarmed black man um, only to be uh, somewhat interrupted by uh, a white officer shooting an unarmed black man only to be interrupted by a school shooting in Knoxville, Tennessee. Like all of that happened in one day. Um, and that's eerily reminiscent of, uh, and last summer in particular, it was eerily reminiscent of 1968. Tom Brokaw, who's one of my heroes, um, little known fact that I love Tom Brokaw, like he can like do no wrong in my eyes. Um, he wrote a book entitled Boom 1968. Um, and it was, a, it actually was a documentary as well because he said in 1968, the country was becoming untethered along the issue of race. Um, in February of 68, you had the Orangeburg massacre. In April of 68, you had the assassination of King. In June of 68, you had the assassination of RFK. And you had many soldiers coming home, um, particularly black soldiers in the South who were still treated like second-class citizens upon their arrival back home. And so you had this, you have all of these historical events converging on us at one time. Um, and that's 2020 and 2021. And so I just kind of want us to take stock and place our feet both uh, firmly and squarely on the ground, take a deep breath and think about where we are. Um, even more importantly, I need us to think about how far we've come. I um, am so proud of the efforts that the mayor is putting forth with preserving and telling um, the history of this country. I, I'm one who believes that our curriculum, um, especially public school curriculum, has been decently violent in the miseducation um, um, and lack of uh, truth by which we teach young people the history of this country, for better or worse. And so I think about names um, in our own South Carolina history, some names that you may or may not know, but I want you to think about the import thereof. I think about people like George Elmore, um, who uh, was what they called a Renaissance Negro. I see uh, Reverend Hooker on here. He probably knows the name of George Elmore. Um, because in 1946, George Elmore, they called him a Renaissance Negro because he he um, he had a five and dime store. Uh, he had a liquor store. Uh, he drove a cab and took pictures on the side. He did all of this as a black man in in the in, in Eastover, South Carolina. Um, and uh, George uh, went down in Richland County and um, registered to vote in that summer of 46. And uh, in August of that year, um, he tried to go and vote in the first Democratic primary he can find. And no, y'all don't make no jokes. He wasn't voting for Joe Riley in 1940. <laughs> okay. Y'all leave those jokes alone. Uh, but we all know who the nosiest people in the world are. The nosiest people in the world are poll workers because poll workers know absolutely everybody. And the poll workers in 46 said, Joe, we know you're a Negro. I mean, George, we know you're a Negro. You can't vote here. And so George filled with pride. You know, George filed a lawsuit, which was known as Elmore versus Rice. Um, as soon as he filed the lawsuit, though, they firebombed his liquor store, stopped distributing to his five and dime store. His wife literally died in a mental health hospital. She died in Bull Street. I know some of you all may have heard of the old mental health facility on Bull Street. Um, from having to undergo all the trauma, the crosses being burned on her yard, et cetera, et cetera. But um, although he died a broken man, Elmore versus Rice is the reason that African-Americans um, can vote in primaries in the South. That's a history that's only an hour and 15 minutes from where you are. Um, so I always think about how far we've come. I think about Sarah Mae Fleming, um, who is one of my heroes. 
People don't know the story of Sarah Mae Fleming. She was from Hopkins, South Carolina. And uh, Sarah uh, was working at a hotel on Main Street in Columbia. It got off work and came and sat down on a bus. But her sin wasn't sitting at the front of the bus. It was that when the bus driver told her to get up, she couldn't. She didn't leave out the back door that the colored used. She walked out the front door. Bus driver punched her in the stomach and rolled her down the steps. Um, Sarah joined the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, some enterprising lawyers from the Legal Defense Fund. And back then, the buses, and I don't know how many people remember this, but the buses were run and owned by South Carolina Electric and Gas. They were run by the utility companies. And so the name of that case is Fleming versus SCENG. And Sarah Mae Fleming, um, right there from South Carolina, uh, laid the foundation in action and law for another young lady who sat down 17 months later named Rosa Parks. Like there wouldn't be a Rosa Parks if there was not a Sarah Mae Fleming. And she was right here in South Carolina. Um, and last but not least, I think about um, Harry and Eliza Briggs, who, um, if any of you all know Jim Clyburn, you know that uh, he loves telling the story of Harry and Eliza Briggs in Little Clarendon County, South Carolina. Um, you know, without Harry and Eliza Briggs filing a lawsuit in 1949, there would be no Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. It was the first case filed in that landmark collection of cases. And so I just want you to, as, we, as we're in this very weird convergence of historical events at this time, just sit back and think how far we've come. And you'll get a really conflicting answer, but you'll get one that I think will motivate you to do what John Lewis said, which is to continue to step onto the pages of history. Um, you'll realize that when you ask yourself that question, you realize that we've made progress. Anybody who tells you we haven't made progress in this country is just lying to you. No matter how dark it gets, you understand that we've made a great deal of progress in this country. But the challenge for us is understanding that we still have yet a ways to go. And for the young people, the students, those who are the leaders, and I hate when people say you're the leaders of the future. I think that's so perverse. You're like, the, you're the leaders of right now. You're not the leaders of the future. You're the leaders of right now. Um, I'm someone who believes, uh, who, who who doesn't believe that this country is irredeemable by any stretch. I think like uh, Maya Angelou and Amanda Gorman said though, that this country is unfinished. And so it's our challenge to go out and reimagine what this country should be. And I think that's a, such a refreshing, I think that that is such a visionary, progressive, just thought process to figure out how you're going to reimagine what this country should be. That's the challenge in front of us and whatever you decide to do. Um, you know, Mayor Riley mentioned my father a lot and uh, my father is uh, 76, it'll be 77 uh, this year. And I think back to when he was 23 years old, um, uh, up 26 on the campus of South Carolina State. I think about when he helped organize the protests uh, at South Carolina State. Um, the history books call it the last vestige of discrimination, Jim Crow's final hiding place. It was the last vestige of discrimination in Little Orangeburg, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I think about the students um, and how they went on the 6th and then again on the 8th to protest at bowling alley. Um, and how on the night of the 8th, they couldn't foresee what would happen next. Think about this. I know we, we how many students do we have on this call? We've got about 20. Students. So just imagine that you see some injustice um, in Charleston, you go and protest, and then you come back to the center of your campus, and you build a bonfire on your campus, um, and state troopers and police surround your campus. Um, right out, right in front of the gates. And um, those same state troopers begin to fire shots into the group of students, but not um, tear gas um, or rubber bullets, but deadly double out bug shots are the same bullets we used to hunt deer. And they fired shots into those students at South Carolina State for eight seconds. And I say to people often that in those eight seconds, lives were forever altered and dreams were forever deferred. Um, Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton, none of them over the age of 19. Um, in fact, one was still in high school at Wilkinson High 
This was back before Orangeburg Wilkinson became a thing. He was at the Black High School of Wilkinson High, and he would come every single day after school to walk his mom, who was a janitor at the school, to walk his mom home. And he came that day, that February 8th, to walk her home, and he was caught in gunfire, shot and killed. 28 people were wounded. My father was shot that night. My father was arrested by the only black sheriff's deputy in Orangeburg County at the time. Talk about ironic. Um, and uh, this little bit of history that not many people know, uh, for the one of the only times in the state's history, I-26 was completely shut down between um, Orangeburg and Columbia. And uh, my father was escorted up to um, uh, CCI, where he was housed after his bond was denied. CCI was the Columbia Correctional Institute. I have a legendary CCI story. If anybody wants to hear it during Q and A, I've, I've been to CCI three times, and one of them is is, is a legendary, so only in South Carolina story. Um, my father stayed in prison for about a, a month while his bond was denied. He was housed on death row. They deemed him to be an outside agitator. Um, until he was granted a bond later in between the night of February 8th, 68, and the time of my father's trial. All the officers who fired shots into the group of students were tried and they were all found not guilty. My father subsequently went to trial and they backdated the indictment from February 8th to February 6th. They dropped all the charges except one, which was rioting. And my father was charged, tried and convicted of rioting, becoming the first and only one man riot in the history of this country. <laughs> And I remind folk often that on that night in justice, it left mothers without their sons. It left the pages of our state's history stained red with blood. Um, but when you look at the struggle and the sacrifices that so many people, and that's the blessing, I guess the blessing and the burden of being from the South, that you don't have to read about the history per se. Um, there's so many people right around us who um, sat on jailhouse floors, who um, who smelt gun smoke, who actually were a part of the stories that are written about in history books. And so the question is, how do we go forward? And for me, it was when I was uh, 20 years old and a recent graduate. I remind you guys, you don't have to be 40 to change the world. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I told my mom and dad I was going to run for the South Carolina State House. I had just graduated from Morehouse, and my mom said that she would vote for me, and my dad said he'd think about it. And so uh, it's a true story. I went out and knocked on over 2,600 doors. Uh, I ran against Thomas Road. Thomas was a great, great guy, nice as could be. I didn't think he was a good legislator, but he was a nice guy. And he was 82 years old and had been in office for 26 years, 26 years, which was longer than I had been born. Uh, we knocked on 2,600 doors, went over 55 churches, and on June 13th, 2006. It's amazing how history writes the story sometimes uh, that the agitator's son uh, became a legislator. I think that's that's only can happen in South Carolina. And so I became the youngest black elected official um, in the country and the youngest state legislator. Now, I have to put a caveat with the youngest state legislator in South Carolina history, because there's another guy who claims he was the youngest. He's also a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And I don't think that anybody would have ever thought that Governor Beasley would have ended up with a Nobel Peace Prize. But Governor Beasley, his second and third act in life is one of the most amazing things. And he's a really good friend of mine. And Governor Beasley will tell you he's the youngest state legislator in history. Governor Beasley also said that he ran a 10-8 in the 100-meter dash, which I know was a lie. So I'm going to claim it. And then he probably will claim it when he sees you. So just know, know that. Um, but I, I, I'll wrap up. I'm kind of building up to this last story before we have some back and forth and dialogue. And I remind folk, I'm only 36 years old and I haven't been in politics yet long enough to lie to you. So you can ask me anything you want to you want to ask me. But in 2006, when I got elected, um, something was happening in our world. Um, I see Tyler Mitchell down there. Who, he knows this story, <laughs> knows this story so well. What's up, Tyler? <clears throat> um, everybody and their mom was running for president of the United States. Um, the mayor remembers this because he was getting phone. We were all getting all these phone calls. It was Bill Richardson, Dennis Kucinich, John Edwards, 
um, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, uh, it was Chris Dodd. It was just a motley crew of people. It was a really, really eclectic group of people who were running um, for president of the United States. And I had narrowed my choices down to two people. And those two people were um, John Edwards and Barack Obama. And um, there was nobody um, at the time who talked about poverty like John Edwards. And he was from South Carolina. His, his campaign headquarters was in the Ninth Ward in Louisiana, in New Orleans. And he was friends with Terry Richardson. And, you know, it was just, there was so much there. Let's just say, thank God I made the right choice, though. And so um, finally, I get this phone call. And to all of my young people, um, I get this phone call. Ellen, yeah. he's ready. My son is staring at me right here. Um, I get this phone call and it's from a private number. And let me tell you all that if a private number, if a private number calls you, it's one of two people. It's either somebody very important or it's a student loan company calling to get their money back. <laughs> so I pick up and usually I'm wittier than this. I'm like, I'm usually I'm pretty quick on my feet. I take pride in being decently kind of quick. And I, I pick up and they say, do you have time to speak to Senator Obama? I say, of course. And I'm the only state legislator with a book bag. This is when the law school is two blocks away from the Capitol. And so I'm like passing Sandy's. Y'all remember that Sandy's they had right by the Capitol on Main Street? I'm like walking by Sandy's. And, uh, you know, Barack gets on the phone and he says, um, he says, what, what's going on? How are you? And I say, Senator, you know, I'm on my way to constitutional law class. Why did I tell Barack Obama I was on my way to constitutional law class? But because Barack Obama used to do what? Teach constitutional law. And so he starts peppering me with questions about where we are in class. And I was like any good law student, which means I hadn't read all semester. I didn't know, didn't know where we were. I was, alleged, I was just trying to balance the world on my shoulders. And so finally, I'm like, look, Senator, let, you know, let's kind of get to it. I'm about to walk into Professor Brown, Con Constant Brown. Um, uh, a constitutional law class. And he said, well, Bakari, now is the time I want you to endorse me to be president. I say, I'll do so under two conditions. One is that um, my mom gets to work on a campaign. Um, and uh, two is that you come to my district. He says, done and done. And so I endorsed the president and or the senator at the time began to travel the country with him. And, uh, usually I'm with like Tatiana Ali or Cal Penn from Harold and Kumar. One time I even get to campaign with Michelle Obama. It's just an amazing experience. And then I get a phone call. It's after the Iowa primary, after the New Hampshire primary, that he's coming to South Carolina. He's coming to my district. And I forgot that I represented Bamberg, Baldwin, and Orangeburg County, which means I ain't had no space to put Barack Obama. <laughs> and so we decide we're going to put him at South Carolina State in the gymnasium named after the three young men who were killed in the Orangeburg massacre. We put him in Smith, Hammond, and Middleton Auditorium. Never forget that day. It's crowds of people, international media everywhere. They're playing like ain't no mountain high enough. It's like 10,000 people in the gym. It's a little small stage. I walk in and sitting in the green room, which was the men's basketball locker room, is Chris Tucker and Kerry Washington. And so me, Chris Tucker, and Kerry Washington are just laughing and joking and having a good time. Uh, my friend Rick Wade peeks his head in the door and says, I'll be right back. He goes to the county airport and he comes back with Usher. It's a true story. So it's me, Usher, Chris Tucker, and Kerry Washington waiting on Barack Obama. And then finally, uh, they say it's go time. The senator is here. And um, yeah, I got a funny Usher story if anybody wants to hear. Um, but I go out and I, I begin to... to uh, uh, recite King's I Have a Dream speech, but not the rhythmic cadence of I Have a Dream that One Day We Shall. Instead, I talk about the most important part of that speech in which he talks about the fierce urgency of now. And then I turn around and I introduce Chris Tucker. His beloved gets a little louder. Then he introduces Carrie, gets a little louder. She introduces Usher. All the women start passing out. And then Usher introduces Barack Obama. And it's like a decibel level that you can't imagine. Um, and then we're supposed to get off stage I was supposed to stand on stage, but the senator says you got to get off stage. It's pandemonium. And so we take this picture and it's me 
To my left is Chris Tucker. To my right is the 44th president of the United States. To his right is Kerry Washington and to her right is Usher Raymond. And people always ask me, what were you thinking at that moment? And to help put a pin on everything I'm telling you today, I remember very clearly what I was thinking at that moment. I was only 19 miles away from my home in Denmark, South Carolina, where I had the audacity to tell my parents that I wanted to go out and be a part of the change I wanted to see, where I wanted to run for office, where I wanted to dream big, where I wanted to dream with my eyes open. And I wasn't going to just be confined to my zip code. Um, and I was only 300 yards away from where the blood of my family literally ran through the soil of this great state where my father was shot along with 28 others. And although I was only 300 yards away from where my father was shot and only 19 miles away from where I had these amazing dreams of, of running in the state legislature and, and winning, um, I had gone so far. And so I challenge all of you all to, to eat young and old, if you're 17 or 77, um, to always dream with your eyes open, always um, be dedicated to reimagining what this country should be and always put both feet planted squarely on the ground. And so you can take a moment and take a deep breath, inhale and take a full inventory of where we are. And that way you can go out and be a part of the change we want to see. And so with that, uh, we have about 15 minutes. Let's ask questions. I would love to hear um, whatever you all have, questions, comments, criticisms, or concerns. That's uh, wonderful. Probably the best thing to do is to go ahead and put your questions in the chat. And uh, that'll be, um, but, but probably more likely to, to notice you in the, in the chat if you do that. So uh, we have our, a request, of course, for the CCI story. So yeah, I, I would. I went to CCI uh, twice as a youngster. One time when they were about to close. Now, this is going to be a weird ask because I know none of the students have. But how many of the adults went to CCI before they closed it? Any adults go to CCI before they closed it? It was a fascinating prison. I actually went by the cell. Okay. And so like Madeline and Keyshawn, I see y'all down there and Desmond. I don't know if sometimes y'all get on your computer and you get kind of lost. You start just Googling stuff or YouTube and stuff and you end up in this dark hole. Well, there's a, and, and Mayor Riley's going to be like, why don't give them nightmares. South Carolina is notorious for having one of the most deranged serial killers in the history of the country. His name was Pee Wee Gaskin. Pee Wee Gaskin was a fascinating individual because he was literally like the size of my son, who's a two-year-old toddler. He was a small guy. Um, and he managed to even kill people while he was in prison. So I went and looked at his, you could see his death row cell. My father's death row cell was not far from it, which in itself was fascinating. But my CCI story is a little different because there is a young man who we claim in South Carolina, although in Augusta, they attempt to claim him as well, but he's actually from Beach Island, South Carolina. His name is James Brown. Um, and James Brown happens to be very good friends with my father. Like most civil rights activists and entertainers, there is a huge, there is this nexus. And so my dad tells me one day, we're going to see James. And so we get in the car, we leave Denmark, we ride up to CCI. It's burning up outside and CCI is like right on the river. And so I walk in with my dad. We just stroll through the gates. You hear the buzz and the gates close behind you. And we walk into this huge like cafeteria, like the sitting area where, you know, um, they have like the, the sheets that are painted where families take pictures and stuff sometimes. I don't know if y'all have seen that. So we walk in and, and around the corner comes James Brown. But James's hair is not done. And so James looks at us and James is like, oh, no, nah, little CL, he can't see me like that. Can't see me like that because his hair wasn't done. And so James literally, he, he, this was one of the more random moments. He was like, do you, um, do you think a million dollars is a lot of money, son? And I guess his taxes and things must have been on his mind. I have no idea. And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, it's not. He said, the government's going to take it. He said, when you make a million dollars, you find your favorite tree and you go bury it. And then he told me I couldn't sit in the jail anymore because his hair wasn't done. And so I went outside and my dad gave me the key and told me to crack the window along the back fence of CCI. 
and I sat outside, <laughs> which probably violated some child some child abuse statutes. I sat outside while my dad was inside meeting with uh, James Brown uh, for at least an hour. Um, so that's my CCI and James Brown. <laughs> I love I. Uh, James also has one of the most legendary concerts that was done the night after King was assassinated outside of Boston, Massachusetts. The p- many people will tell you um, that James Brown is the reason that Boston didn't burn completely to the ground after he performed April 5th of 68. What else do we have here? Uh, you did leadership at sea. I'm gonna get to your, I'm gonna get to your question, Madeline, about my Usher story. If you could give, Melanie asked, if you could give advice to a first generation college and law student, what would it be? Um, kind of easy. Um, although you're the first, don't be the last. Um, you know, make sure that you go in, you do extremely well, and you always extend that hand um, to make sure that you you are paving a way for others to come behind you. A lot of people worked extremely hard for you to get to where you are. Um, it's your your task to uh, multiply. I, I, Melanie, think that we teach leadership very poorly in this country. And I'm not picking on Reverend Hooker by any stretch, but a lot of times we teach leadership by saying, how many congregants do you have or how many followers do you have or how many parishioners do you have? That is just a really poor way to teach leadership. I fundamentally think that leadership means and leaders beget other leaders. And so because you have this opportunity, you must beget other people who have this opportunity. You have to create other people around you who will be able to do the same things or similar things to you. And so that would be my advice. And also, man, look, Melanie, this ain't the advice adults want me to give y'all, but enjoy college, enjoy law school, I, my best advice to you is may your may your weekend start on Thursday. Like have like adulting sucks some days. I just can't even lie to you. It's tax season. I haven't slept good because my twins are in my bed. I got to get up every morning and go to work. I just wish I could sleep in some days, play video games, and just walk up and down Market Street on Thursday afternoon and drink a beer. So y'all enjoy it while you got it, okay? Because adulting is a little bit different. Um, how has this, Tyler asked, has this recent historical election changed your outlook on American? Do you see the country improving? I mean, you know, always. I mean, it, that's, a, that's a layered question. Um, I'm fascinated by the 74 million people that voted for uh, uh, Donald Trump. I, I just really, I really am. I think that a lot of times in it, it, watching the party structures in this country shift and morph um, and uh, watching how politics has become more of a, a cult of personality than one's true core political beliefs. Um, oh, let me challenge you all to do this. If you don't mind, uh, Mr. Taylor and Mayor Riley, I would like to um, give your students a challenge. I did this at the University of Chicago. I think we have, I don't know how many more weeks you have in class. So let's just do it over like a nine day period. If you have nine days, if not do it over a six day period. Um, I did this when I taught at the university of Chicago and I I don't want just students to do it. I want all of you all to do it. Okay. And the audacity of me giving you all an assignment, but this is what you got to do. What I did was, and you can cut this down one week. I need everybody to watch 30 minutes of Fox and friends for one week in the morning, okay? The next week, I need you to watch 30 minutes of morning, Joe, every day. And then the next week, I need you to watch 30 minutes of new day, every day. And then at the end of that, that three week period where you've watched Frocks and Friends, New Day and Morning Joe, I want us to come back and have an honest conversation about what you saw the prism in which you saw this country and think about how many people are taking in the information that they saw. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, when I go to the studio at night, like last night, uh, we had CNN on the screen and I was getting ready for Don Lemon. We were on the streets of Brooklyn Center um, in Minnesota, as they say, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, Fox and Fox News. I can't, it was the the Greenfield, I think, is his name show. They were playing. They were playing like the greatest hits of the infrastructure bill. It was like you were looking at two different countries at the same time. So I, I say all of that to say because I want people to have a greater sense of individual responsibility in what they consume. Um, I want people to seek out news from different sources. Um, and I want people to be rooted in fact. And I think by going through this kind of mental exercise, it helps you get to whatever that may be. Um, let's see. I did a presentation on your father in my civil rights leadership class and loans so much. And I also went to Morehouse for grad school as well. My question is, in the times we are in today, how important is community engagement and youth development? It's more important than ever. Um, this is not for the students in the class, but this is for the generation above them. I think that many times we don't fully appreciate what Generation Z, which are those individuals who are in school right now, are going through and have gone through. Um, think about a child that was born in 2000. That means they lived through 9-11. That means they've lived through a housing crisis and bubble. That means they've lived through the first black president. They lived through Donald Trump. They lived through a great pandemic. They lived through the largest mass shooting in the history of this country. People forgot that we had that in Las Vegas, Nevada. They've lived through the Charleston massacre. They have social media every day and they're still here and they're only 21 years old. I don't think that we give them enough credit or appreciate what they've been through and how they've lived and the things that they've seen in that very short period of time. Not to mention that we're still in conflicts around the world. So, um, oh, and that, that's why I was saying that engaging community engagement and youth development is so important. The mayor is probably a better one to talk about this, but we both believe in this thing called early childhood education because your your ROI is greater. The more money we invest in the front end, the less we have to invest in the back. And so I'm a huge proponent of, of that engagement. And the state of South Carolina is getting an extra $2.1 billion from this last round of stimulus money. Not many people know about that, but I hope that your nonprofits, I hope that your um, uh, that your early childhood education programs, et cetera, had their handout uh, to Merle Smith. I know in Charleston, y'all are used to running the state and now that has moved to Florence. So, so y'all gonna have to, you know, the area code for those individuals running the state of South Carolina, it's, it's not, you know, Bobby Harrell and Glenn McConnell anymore. You gotta go see uh, Hugh Leatherman and, uh, and Jay Lucas now. So it's changed. Um, how has your dad's experience shaped your perspective on America? That's probably, Thomas, one of the best questions that I get. Um, you know, I'm angrier about February 8th, 68 than my father is. My father has, um, you know, I always say he could have lashed out, but he always believed in what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. I think that <laughs> Mayor Riley's known my father longer than I have. <laughs> Uh, but he is just a, he is a, he's a soul that's seen a lot. And so he's always calm. He's always a believer in tomorrow. You know, Thomas, one of the things that I've taken from my dad is I always remind folk that you can only eat an apple one bite at a time. And I live my life in 24 hour increments. And today my prayer is, my, my prayers are simple, man. I just, I, I want my parents to be proud and I want today to be better than yesterday. And I just feel like if I move through the world, you know, biting that apple one bite at a time, making sure that today I'm better than yesterday, then I can leave my children a better world than the one that I inherited. And I also think that everything my father went through, you know, he had surgery on his shoulder uh, probably like maybe 10 years ago. And I'm like, man, what? Why you have, you're not out there throwing baseballs? All this, you know, I forget, you know, for a guy he got shot in the shoulder. Um, and so, you know, that required them to go in and, 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 you know, take some stuff out and move some stuff around. You just, you forget about those physical scars, but also those mental wounds that come from a lifetime um, in struggle. 
Um, I always enjoy your remarks on CNN. I've met you, but I've always wanted to meet your dad, as is the story of my life. Now people just want to meet my twins. Nobody ever wants to meet me. <laughs> That's fine. Um, my dad's a cool dude. All you need to do if you want to see him in Charleston is go to either Rodney Scott's or he eats at cafeterias. He's a meet and three fan. Old school like that. Um, Margaret watched the commentary of the flag come down while on a trip in Germany. That was my first real experience being hired by CNN. Um, what was it like being the youngest black legislator in a state like South Carolina? It must have been so hard to earn your keep there, maybe. Also, lastly, what was it like transferring to CNN? Um, the legislature was wild, but I was so young and I loved it. I remember there was a there was a state legislator that you all had in Charleston. She was the majority whip and she was literally one of the baddest people. She and Gilda Cobb Hunter like just invoked fear in everybody. Her name was Annette Young. I don't know if y'all know Annette Young, but Annette evoked so much fear in everybody. They were so tough and they had to be because it's a white male's boys club. That's what the South Carolina state legislature is. I mean, it's, you know, it's a country club. And so me going, being so young, I remember the first questioning that I've ever got was from Annette Young. And I realized that I had to be extremely prepared every day. Um, and I was just, it was, it was, I was fortunate. I was blessed. Um, but I, it, it, when I got my feet up under me, I realized that I represented, you know, uh, 37,300 citizens like every other state house member up there, even though I was from, you know, the huge metropolitan area of Bamberg County. Um, on CNN, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, Denmark has 3,300 people. And that's only when school's in session because we actually count Voorhees in our numbers. Don't tell nobody that. That's a, that is a geographical secret. Don't tell nobody how Denmark creeps over 3,000 citizens. But just imagine you from a town where you got 3,000 people, where you jump ditches as a kid, and every night you go and you speak to about a million and a half people. And you tell them how you feel. But being black and doing this job represents a different challenge because I say this with every ounce of humility, you can't really have a bad day because there are not many of us. And the way that the world sees black men many times is through my presentation or the lens of me on TV. And so it's not that I speak for black folk because we, we are definitely not monolithic and I can't speak for all of us by any stretch. But I do try to give a voice to the pain that's felt. I do try to speak our truth. I think that, you know, I had a moment where I was talking about George Floyd. It was early. I came on after George Floyd's brother. This was last year. And I was on with Dante Stallworth and I kind of broke down because of my, it was, you know, we were doing <clears throat> segments from our home. We were no longer going to um, the studio and my twins were back in the back sleep. It was like the 6.30 hour and my daughter was upstairs and I was just like, you know, what do we tell our children? And I think that, um, you know, my, some tears begin to flow down my, my face. You know, there's a conversation that black parents have to have with black teens. My daughter is about to be 16. And there's a conversation I have to have with her that white parents don't have to have. And it's just exhausting sometimes. Um, but I continue to try to, you know, grow in it and, and make South Carolina proud. Because a lot of, you know, there have been times on the national level where we haven't necessarily made our state the proudest. And so I, I attempt to do that. Um, are you confident that efforts by the Republican Party to pass voter suppression legislation will be thwarted? thwarted? Uh, <clears throat> the only way it will is if we pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, um, which unfortunately um, doesn't look like it will, mainly because um, of the filibuster. <laughs> I don't know any other way to put it. You know, I, I I appreciate our big tent as a Democratic Party, but I did not go out and do everything I could do and to get Joe Biden elected to only have an agenda that was palatable to Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin. That's starting to get on my nerves. Um, so I don't know. I know the mayor probably knows Joe Manchin. Maybe he'll he'll give him a give him a call one day um, and and see. Uh, and see what Joe's thinking. But that's the only way that, that we will be able to prevent those things from happening. Um, so we'll see. Uh, and the last thing is about South Carolina Dems turning to state. Um, 
And can you come in here? Okay. And I don't, um, <laughs> it takes a lot of, what's wrong? It takes a lot of time and effort to turn the state and money. It's going to take about 10 to $15 million. Okay. You want to say hey to the people? Say hello. Say hey, Mayor Riley. Hi, honey. <laughs> this is Sadie. Sadie's my little miracle baby. Sadie, on September 1st of 2019, she got a special treat. They gave her a new liver, and now she's doing wow. great. Say, say bye. She's adorable. She's bossy. Good gosh, bossy. Um, and so um, Stacy started those efforts in 2015. Um, it took five years, and we just haven't put that effort into our state party. And Stacy realized something in Georgia that, like, it ain't rocket science, but nobody realized, like, you know, Georgia is more than Atlanta and Savannah. Uh, they began to go in the rural parts of the state and began to cultivate that voter base. And so um, hopefully we will have the resources and the vision to do that, but we have a long way to go. I, I, people have asked me, and I don't even know if I told any, I mean, I, I, I'm not doing it, but this might be breaking news for this class, so people will stop asking me. No, I am not running against Tim Scott in 2022. I just think that that's a mission that is... Um, uh, kind of foolish. <laughs> um, and no, I'm not running against Henry McMaster for governor in 2022. I think we're going to have two amazing candidates who try, Joe Cunningham and uh, Mia Butler. Um, having run against Henry McMaster, he is one of the more um, um, boring candidates to run against, which makes him extremely effective. Um, he doesn't make mistakes on the campaign trail. He doesn't engage you. He raises money. And he, um, you know, when a candidate doesn't make mistakes, it's like, a team, you know, three yards in a cloud of dust if you're playing football. Um, it's just kind of fascinating to watch. And so I, I don't see um, I don't see victories in either one of those races right now. But, I, you know, I would have never thought we were going to win Georgia and Arizona in 2020. So um, I'm confident and comfortable and waiting for, uh, Jim Clyburn to retire whenever that is. But you know how many people are, as they say, Joe Riley, you know this, you know how many people are in a cemetery who were waiting on Strom Thurmond to retire. So, <laughs> you know, we shall see. The last story is the Usher story before I go. So um, this is a true story. Usher um, came in that day and Usher, uh, I'll never forget it, his father had just passed. So he was, he didn't have a good relationship with his father, but he was a little little down and we're standing in this little doorway before we go out on stage and us looks at me and he says man you speak all the time you're in politics what should I say and I'm, by this time I had been hanging out with Chris Tucker all day so I think I'm funny and I'm like us man just go out there and say praise God I love all the beautiful women crowd to go crazy just start off with that it's a political event crowd to go crazy I was joking and I went out there, and the first thing that he said is, "Praise God! I love all the beautiful black women." And me and Kerry Washington and Chris Tucker were like, "No, no, please! That was a joke." And then he spoke for twenty minutes, and we only had five, so we were burning up out there too. So that's my that's my funny Usher story. But uh, Mayor Riley, I'm always here for you. Next semester, please let me come in person to spend some time with you guys. I love the Citadel. Um, I love everything that you all are doing in Charleston. Um, I just, I'm grateful um, that I have an opportunity to speak uh, here today. All right, thank you so much for your, your generous time and for your thought-provoking and stimulating a conversation. It's so generous of you. I know the students and all who are uh, listening and, and watching uh, appreciate, it, appreciate it and enjoyed it. And we're very proud of you. And please give your daddy my best. He's going to be so happy, and I'm going to make sure that he reaches out and gives you a call. Um, to everyone that I'm not there with, please, I wish you nothing but health and happiness during these troubled times. And find somebody that you don't think like. Find somebody that you um, don't necessarily agree with on everything. And y'all go out and sit on the porch and drink some wine or beer, and, and let's begin to have conversations with one another again and see if we can heal the divides we have in this country. So, Amen. Thank you, and God bless you all. I'll see you soon, Mayor Riley. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. Have you listened to our Book Notes Plus podcast? Taking the concept from Brian Lamb's long-running Book Notes TV program, the podcast offers listeners more books and authors. 
Book Notes Plus features a mix of new interviews with authors and historians and some old favorites from the archives. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts.